In conversations tonight, my guest is an American architect who's made India his home. He's the grand, and if you'll forgive me, the adjective old man of Indian architecture. His work has been described as democratic, a harmony of the traditional with the modern, and a style that blends the environment with modern architectural techniques. I'm delighted to welcome Mr. Joseph Allen Stein. Mr. Stein, when you drive around or you walk around and you see buildings and structures, uh, as an architect, uh, what, what, what do you look for? What, what strikes you as, 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 as making a, a piece of, of, of work, of architecture, as, as good, perhaps? Well, that's a very large question. What strikes one is that architecture is the mirror of society. And as you just described it, the, the, the reflection is not a very happy one. So what strikes one, I think, more than anything else is the terrible deterioration of the last few decades. In, in, in what ways and in, in what elements that, that, that you see and, and strike you as, as representing this deterioration? Well, all you have to do is look at Red Fort as it must have been, uh -huh. or visualize it as it must have been, as it is now, Chandi Chowk, Of course, there, there are always exceptions. Architecture is actually the mirror of society. So everything that exists in society exists almost exact same proportion in architecture. It's rather different than, say, lit in literature. In literature, literature is a mirror of society also, but as seen through the eyes of of, of the writer with his own slant, but in architecture it's the exact proportion of what actually exists, the petrol pump, the garbage on the street, the palace. Well, what formal role does, does the architect play uh, in, in, in determining this, sort of, this decay, perhaps? Not much. Actually, archi ar the architect is a technician. He's not the designer. I should say, I, I put that wrongly. He's not the decision maker. The decision maker is the, the designer. With, with, with someone who's, who's, who's now sort of as established and, and well known as you are, uh, to what degree do you feel you still have, have freedom in, in, in buildings you design and, and, and construct? Uh, that's a very large question. Uh, a successful building is always and invariably a collaboration between a number of elements, but particularly the, the client and the architect. Architecture is basically a teamwork, and I've not yet succeeded in building a good job except for a good client. Do you tend to have problems sometimes with clients sort of pulling in one direction and, 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 and you sort of resisting and, and not feeling comfortable uh, with, with, with the way the, the client wants you to, to construct a building? Because after all, the building at the end of the day is known as, 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 as a Stein building. Yes, there is, a, there is a problem sometimes, but not very often because usually people don't come to an architect unless he does the kind of work they're looking for. You came to, uh, to India more than 40 years ago. You were an, 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 an architect in America, working in France, and you'd worked extensively in Europe. What, what, what prompted you to sort of give up uh, a possible flourishing, promising career in the West to come to India at that time? I came here as a teacher. To West Bengal? To West Bengal. And my students were very, very, excellent people to work with and be with. It was very stimulating. They were skillful, they were hardworking, and they were idealistic. Well, when you got this, this invitation to come to India, what, 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 sort of what went on in your head? And, and, and why, why make this trip all the way to the east? Well, what I had done, I had... I was ready to make a change. I had the idea when I started work that I would take a sabbatical every seven years and decide what to do with the next seven years. So I did that only once. 
And I, in the course of that, I was invited to come to India. And it was a period in Indian history which was very challenging. And, and, and what, was, what, what was happening at that time that you felt excited and challenged about? Well, the memory of Gandhi and Tagore was fresh. My students were full of enthusiasm and skill. It was a very promising period. Did you meet with Tagore? No, he was dead before I came. And with Gandhi? He was dead also. So when did you come? I came in 1952. Uh, you, you know, you had exciting students, and, 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 and what was it about India at that time that, that, that you found stimulating and exciting that, that made you want to stay on for, for the rest of your life? Well, it was a privilege to work here then. Uh, I, I was set to leave uh, India at the end of my teaching contract, which was a two and a half year contract when I was persuaded to remain to help plan the steel towns. It was a very challenging task and one that particularly interested me. And what was challenging about designing a steel town? Well, low-cost housing and mass housing has always been a particular interest of mine. And that, of course, is the epitome of it. So for some years I worked in areas like Durgapur, Jamshedpur, Burkhala. And in the course of doing that, I, be, I also did other things. And the, the, the response was very gratifying. I came in contact with many people whom it was a rare pleasure and privileged to work with. Who were some of these people? Well, like like uh, Siddhi Deshmukh, former finance minister of India, uh, Vikram Sarabhai, Homi Baba. What are your some of your memories of, of people like Deshmukh? Was that what led to uh, working at the, the India International Center complex? Dr yes, directly. He appointed me as, as the architect there. He had been chairman of the University Grants Commission. And in that capacity, he had been asked by Dr. Radhakrishnan to take the leadership in establishing the India International Center, which was a project jointly conceived by Dr. Radhakrishnan and John D. Rockefeller, who had already founded it a similar center in New York and Japan. Tell us about the uh, Indian International Center and, and, and the designing of it. Uh, what, are the, what are the architectural elements uh, about it that, that, that you find special and, and, and significant that you were striving to achieve? Well, I suppose uh, it's Indian International Center represents a blending of modernity and regionalism. Right. You can say that regionalism without modernity is reactionary. And uh, modernity without re regional sensitivity is just that, it's uh, insensitive. And so the India International Center represented a particularly challenging situation on the edge of Lodi Park there. And with an inspiring program and a very sympathetic client, it was a challenging thing indeed to work on. The amazing quality of the International, Indian International Center over the years is that it's, it's a structure that's sort of retained its, its freshness uh, and, and its architectural relevance in a sense. And, and you have continued to interact with the center and, it, and its growth. Yes, in fact, my, my colleagues are designing an annex to the center right now, or have designed it or are building it. 
to you sort of go back to a, a, a building you've done and, 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 and wish you'd done it differently now that it was locked in in, in, in mortar and concrete? No, I wouldn't say that. Uh, but I, I think the most interesting building I've done in many ways is, Treva is Treveni, Treveni Kalasangam. Because there the client has continued to build on the foundation that the architect left, so to speak, in a very cons constructive way. That's a very gratifying experience. Do you go back to Treveni and, and, and linger there and, 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 and look at how uh, something that was, that was on the drawing board is, is, is now sort of living and vibrant? Yes, I've done that with pleasure a number of times. Because Mrs. Sridharani, the director of uh, Treveni, is still active there. And it's a remarkable institution. It owes as much to her as to any single individual. Uh, she has never made a, an addition there that hasn't been an improvement, which is a rare thing. You mentioned uh, somewhere that, that, that when you came to India uh, in, in, in 1950s with, with, with the charisma of Nehru presiding over India in a sense, uh, it, it, it was an exciting time and it, it reminded you of what it must have been like in, in the United States with, with, with Jefferson. Yes, that's right. What was this sort of magic of India for you at that time? Well, we, I think the, the problem has been all these decades how to achieve a technological society with a social and an ecological dimension. And now the vision of Gandhi and Nehru was different, but both of them had a strong ecological and social dimension. Today you see what is happening in the world, which is high technology, but uh, without an ecological or social dimension. And so that's, that's the major problem of our time. To what extent do you think that uh, sort of modern techniques and technological advances have facilitated uh, low-cost, efficient housing for, for communities? No, I don't think it has at all. It has not facilitated it because the basis of low-cost, efficient housing lies outside the realm of architecture. It's, a, it's in the realm of planning. The, of course, it varies with uh, specific locations, but to talk about the location and the problem in India. India has trebled or perhaps even quadrupled in population since the original transportation network froze the, si the placement of cities. The, a, a city like Delhi has increased in population many more than 10 times in that period. Yet it's basically Yet the basic transportation network was established by the railroads about 150 years ago or more. And it's now hopelessly overcrowded. They can't even get more trains on, on, on the tracks. They run them as close together as possible. So the, so the, ba the basic element is the transportation system. That's what makes land available or denies it. And India is trying to hopelessly expand in a network that cannot accommodate what's being attempted. So as sort of, sort of as, as, as an anguished architect, perhaps, um, uh, what, 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 what advice would you give sort of a, a town planner in, in a city like Delhi? Well, you see, uh, Technology is an integral part of our existence and it's, it has per performed marvels. Men have stood on the moon, something that was unbelievable. Yet, as Frank Lloyd Wright, 
the well-known architect s said, uh, mankind has the essential tool of the times by the blade, as, thousands, as millions of lacerated hands testify. That's what we see everywhere. So we have a, a magnificent tool in technology, but the way we use it, it has very little ecological or social dimension. And it is destroying more than it is creating. In fact, most of the investment that is currently going on is to compound, will compound the problem rather than solve it. But isn't, in, in, in some ways, uh, technology uh, inherently intrusive as, as populations grow and you need to provide sort of habitat for them? Uh, aren't we at best sort of engaging in, in, in a salvage uh, operation so that it doesn't get worse? We're not engaging in a salvage operation. As I can see, we're, we're just engaging in an operation which is going to sink the ecological ship. What elements would make sort of habitat eco-friendly? The first thing is that the, the key element of land is land, and the access to land is through transportation. Now, the country struggles with an inadequate transportation system Ill and ill-located centers. India is actually an immensely fertile and, and well-favored geographic area. But right now what is happening is very little attention is paid to the ecology. What is happening here in Delhi is a vivid example. Uh, the easiest place for Delhi to expand was across the Jumna River and go into the, the floodplain area between the Hindon and the Ganges or, and the Yam, Jamna River. This, is the mo this was the most fertile agricultural land in the country. It's, it's the last place that should have been taken over by industry. On the other direction, the area between Gurgaon and Faridabad, south of Delhi, is, is inf essentially infertile, very suitable for development. And this, this illustrates what is best is being destroyed, what was available is not being made good, good use of. For most of us lay people, uh, you know, frequently we, 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 we're not conscious formally of, of the impact of architecture in our lives. And, and yet subliminally uh, it, it has a very profound impact on the quality of our lives. In, in, in what ways would you explain this relationship? Well, we just covered that to a degree when I quoted uh, Churchill when he, actually he, he said what I mentioned, which was uh, in, con in debate concerning whether they should rebuild the bombed out houses of parliament as they were or not. And he made this remarkably simple statement. We shape our buildings and afterwards they mold, mold us. And it's inescapable. For, for, for most of us, again, we have this sort of uh, uh, this, this, this sort of this vision of, of, of architecture with, with the passion and the drive that comes from from reading Fountainhead and Anne Rand and, 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 and material of, of that nature, uh, with, with a great deal of romanticism around uh, the work of an architect. How much of, of sort of how, how grounded in reality do you feel a, a good architect needs to be, perhaps? Well, I think that's not quite the question you started with. The, I'd rather try to answer that, that question, which is that see architecture as an, a background or an environment for a growing boy. A boy who, who, who a few generations ago would have grown up in a situation where they were 
trees and, and, and water and rocks, and he would have t tested himself by climbing a, a tree or jumping over a, a stream or something like that, and would have seen the stars at night. Now that boy grows up under conditions where he tests himself by stealing an automobile or something like that. He doesn't see the stars at night. It's a big difference. But isn't that sort of a part of a much, much larger sort of sociological phenomena than, 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 than merely sort of uh, uh, architecture in some ways? Well, yes, it's, it's, it's all interwoven. It's all, all one fabric. If, if you were sort of uh, uh, training and you have young architects working with you, um, what are the elements, sort of, what, what, what qualities would you look for uh, in a young architect that would, that would suggest promise? Actually, uh, a promising person is one who can educate himself. In other words, he's, a fair, he's not dependent on his teacher. Who are the architects that you, that you admire, uh, whose, whose work that you admire and, and, and you feel have, have influenced you? Well, I was very fortunate. I had a number of very positive influences when I was younger. My, t my t teachers in university were people whom I admired, which is a very fortunate thing. I had the privilege of working with Richard Neutra and Elio Sarn, and two very great architects. And I've been very much influenced by the work of Frank Lloyd Wright and Louis Sullivan. And I've also been influenced in a different way by the logical approach of the European architects, particularly uh, uh, what is known as the Bauhaus school. In what ways is, is, is say, architecture different, or uh, the approaches to architecture different uh, in, in, in the developing world as opposed to uh, the developed world, perhaps? Well, in the developed world, there's uh, much higher level of technology. And much of ordinary architecture is very much a matter of putting together factory built elements, prefabricated elements. This is less, this is rapidly changing, but still less characteristic in, in India, but it's changing rapidly. Who are some of the sort of the architects uh, working in India who, who you admire and you feel may have made significant contributions to, to sort of manifesting uh, the, the kind of uh, ideal architecture that, that 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 you would propound, or propagate, or recommend? Well, there are many many good architects in in India. Uh, uh, I wouldn't like to answer that question because it would leave out to as many names as I could, could name. But among, but among the architects whose work is quite notable here is Charles Correa. Uh, what distinguishes, say, Charles Correa's work for you? What makes it uh, impressive? Uh, a vigorous and socially oriented ma imagination. And there's Raj Raywell, who has a, developed a very, very well-considered elegant tech, technology. Uh, there's uh, Laurie Baker, who's done ex exceedingly significant work in the field of low-cost housing, and there are many others. 
what kind of is 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 is, is there a, a a project that 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 you that you wish you were commissioned that you could that you could do um, that is, is is there an unfulfilled ambition a dream? Well, I think the the critical problem today is to develop a, an appropriate technology, which really an appropriate technology means a high. We, cannot turn our back on what is commonly called high technology. Uh, it's, it is decidedly more efficient in many ways. But it's also inefficient in many ways. It's a very comp complex affair. So what we're, the essential problem is how to tr move from high technology to advanced technology by which I mean high technology with an ecological and a social dimension. Mr. Stein, thank you very much for the, the, the privilege and the honor of hosting you on this program. Thank, thank you very you. much indeed. Thank you.